Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the La Lita Loca Cruise Podcast. And man, the hits keep rolling on. So many cool things going on in cruising right now. We've witnessed over the last six weeks the coming on the scene of Carnival Cruise Line's newest cruise ship, the Carnival Jubilee. We've also seen the world's largest cruise ship make its debut, Royal Caribbean's Icon of the Seas. And I've got a special guest today that's been on both of those cruise ships. And he's also a guy that cruises with small children. So we cover a lot of topics today and we talk about a lot of interesting things things. Should the cruise lines watch your kids? What's it like on the Icon of the Seas? Does the Carnival Jubilee, do do they do what they're supposed to do down there in Texas? Uh, Very excited to share with you this conversation with fellow cruise creator Derek Phillips. Derek Phillips from Island Time. Let's go. here with Derek from Island Time. Derek, how the heck are you, man? Man, I am good. Doing really good. I uh, just got off a cruise a couple of weeks ago, taking a little break. I saw your show yesterday. You're taking just a little break and then getting ready to hop back on in March. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm excited to cruise again, but I got a little personal stuff I got to do. Got to get a little surgery knocked out. But then when I come back in March, it's going to be six weeks, six weeks in a row. I'm going to, I won't be home for six weeks, which is probably the longest I've ever been away traveling. So I'm excited about that, but enough about me. I want to know about you, Derek. What, what is, as if you are a cruising superhero, what is your origin story? How did you get into cruising? Oh, I'll share this with you. So uh, I grew up in Arkansas and uh, grew up single mom. Uh, I have a twin brother and a sister, but we really ne- had never had a chance to travel. We didn't go to the beach. We didn't go to theme parks, things like that. And so uh, made my way through high school, through college, and Amanda and I get married. Uh, and of course, as tradition holds, right, the groom is supposed to be responsible for the honeymoon. And so that's exactly what I do. I book a cruise for a honeymoon, Carnival Conquest out of New Orleans. Uh, and you can imagine not being out of the state even at that point, how eye-opening Nor- New Orleans was. Wow. And, and a cruise was. <laughs> and so we are on our honeymoon, and uh, Amanda trusts me to book the cruise. It's a seven-day cruise. Uh, we take it and absolutely fell in love with cruising on our honeymoon. It's uh, 12 years ago. Wow, that, that's awesome. Yeah, it, isn't it great? So, like, I, I never cruised before. I cruised with my wife the first time with the lovely Jenny B. So I love the fact that we share that. Isn't that – it's kind of a cool thing to be able to share with your significant other, right? It really is, especially when you're really green. You don't know what you're getting into, right? You book it. You're not sure what, what's included, what costs extra. You just kind of grab each other by the hand and go. For instance, I'll tell you, I'll share this with you. Uh you know, we get on board, and the Conquest is a smaller ship. And with the old mustard drill, everyone's supposed to get outside, uh, and you're packed outside, right? And we're here at mustard drill. You know, we're going to have a mustard drill, and, and we have no clue. And we thought, <laughs> like some people, that they were talking about a mustard drill. Oh, wow. And uh, being the newlyweds and green cruisers we were, we were like, we're not going outside. Let's, let's just hang <laughs> up in the cabin. And uh, we were surprised by the knock at the door. Uh, hey, you need to leave the cabin. You need to go to your mustard drill. And so, like you said, you just kind of figure it out together. You do. And that's part of the fun of it. That's pretty exciting. So 12 years – well, look, you've thrown me for a loop already. So you have a twin brother. Is this an identical twin or a fraternal twin? Fraternal twin That's okay. what they say. And for most of our life, we have looked completely different. But it's mm. odd the last five or seven years, as we get older, we're starting to look – kind of alike similar so it's it's been weird the last five or seven years because people are they they never believed us now they're starting to believe that we're twins so that's what i was curious because you know some days you know i watch you a lot on the youtube i was just wondering if you'd ever subbed your brother in or something like that but is it always you on the youtube is that is that a fair assumption it is for for the most part daniel has uh walked in on recording twice and and i and i can't even see him but i see him in the the camera, you know, on the on the screen, and both times I've had him just join. And <laughs> honestly, honestly, give him the credit. Okay, those are two of my high, highest viewed videos. You know, he's he's more off the cuff, 
Uh, he's a little bit more, you know, he's going to really say what's on his mind. Uh, and, of course, he didn't care who's viewing it, right? It's not his channel. And so, <laughs> you know, I was hitting him under the table like, hey, you, you, you can't say that, you know. And so, uh, but it's neat to have. I've had him on just twice. It was a surprise. And then Amanda, of course, joins, joins me as much as she can when we go live on Sunday or Monday nights. Oh, man, it's that, always that's easier, ex- though. You know it, Tony. When, the, yeah. when GB joins, it's things are a lot easier. And they run smoothly. The yeah, it's it's <laughs> it, it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing when you when you got that co-pilot with you there in your seat uh, next to you and but yeah I, I, I got to go look for those uh, episodes with your brother a little double vision there so twelve years of cruising uh, what cruise lines have you cruised on what's your primary one what's your approach yeah. to how you pick your cruises absolutely I, I will self admittedly share that I probably didn't start off with cruising the way I should have, the way I recommend people to now. So we started off on our honeymoon with Carnival. We loved it, as most people do. So we get back home, what do we do? We book another cruise with Carnival, right? And we rinsed and we repeated, and I think we've been on, I think I think next month in March will be my 25th Carnival mm. cruise. I think it'll be my milestone. I'll get that diamond card. Uh, I didn't even realize that till the other day. And so we've cruised a lot of Carnival. Uh, we've cruised uh, Norwegian as well, a, you know, a totally different product and offering. Uh, we've been on the Prima. We enjoyed her. Um, we were surprised, really, with selling with Royal Caribbean last minute a couple, I guess it's been 10 days ago, on the Icon of the Seas. Uh, so that was, of course, completely different. And then this summer, um, we're, we're looking to go to Europe. And I know your big news, and the news that impacted a lot of people with the Sun Princess, uh, but we're looking at maybe cruising on the Sun Princess, uh, but we've also looked maybe at Royal cruising in Europe. We did that last year and really enjoyed it. Wow! So uh, Icon of the Seas was your first Royal Caribbean cruise ship? Yeah, is that that's wrong? <laughs> that's wrong, right? <laughs> Look, we're going to talk more about that later. That 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 is uh, crazy for sure. But since you've got so much experience with Carnival, let's talk about that a little bit. You've yeah. seen over the last few years with the advent of the XL Cruise Class. I feel like a shift in Carnival. Uh, what do you think about that new class of cruise ship? Does it still feel like Carnival to you, or have they changed it so much with the XL class that it doesn't feel like Carnival? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And Carnival, like all cruise lines in the industry, they all have you know stigmas or stereotypes. You know, whether it's you know, hey, these these are the type of people that cruise Carnival, or these are the type of people that cruise Holland America. Uh, but I think cruise lines uh, over the last, especially uh, four, six, eight years, has really tried to streamline and offer a lot of the same thing. You're starting to see that with Princess and Norwegian, you know, turn more family friendly. But uh, Carnival, the XL class, they've been a, a huge success. They are a bigger ship, and of course, you're going to always have people who don't like the bigger ships, right? No matter what is on the ship, new offerings or same offerings. They're not going to like the ship. But I think Carnival has done a good job of, of building something bigger, 180,000 gross tons, that will appease to those who want bigger, but also keep a lot of the relics and a lot of their traditions and activities and venues uh, at the same time. So I think it's been a balancing act. I think they've done a good job. And I really think that Carnival doesn't see uh, building new ships uh, as a competition with Royal. I don't, you know, Royal. First off, why would you want to consider it as a competition <laughs> with Royal because you're going to lose it? But instead, yeah, I think, absolutely. I think they're, absolutely. they're trying to protect what they've built, what they've done, but introduce to some new things. Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, you make a great point. I think it I think it is kind of hard to compete with Royal. But, uh, you know, I've seen a little bit of competition with Royal over the last couple of days. And I, I know you've seen this video of the new celebration key. And I posed the question earlier today, is this the Coco K killer? Uh, what do you think? Do you think there's enough meat on the bones in that celebration key promo to really make you think that, you know, you know in my mind, if I was saying, hey, I just want to go to the Bahamas. And I don't really care if I go anywhere. I just want a nice beach day, and I want it to be all included. Coco K comes to mind. I'm going to go on a real premium yeah. cruise ship on Royal Caribbean, the best private island in the business, in my opinion. But yeah. then today, I'm, I'm watching that video, and I'm seeing that I'm seeing all you know this massive lagoon and the water slides. What do you think? Do you think uh, Do you think Celebration Key has the potential to be a Coco K killer? 
Hey, that that is interesting there. And and as much as we we want to say Carnival doesn't want to compete with Royal, they do. I think in that space uh, for multiple reasons. One that uh, Carnival Cruise Line and other cruise lines need destinations to go. We're seeing a lot of these ships, and you were on the Jubilee last week. She's doing the same itinerary over and over and over. Mm-hmm. So they need new places. Uh, but it's it was interesting. They threw out the video yesterday on National Plan Your Vacation Day, and said, hey. Royal spent 250 million on theirs. We're spending right now 200 million, and uh, I thought that was neat too. What they're calling their zones—they're not calling them neighborhoods or zones. They're uh, calling them portals. You know, it's always got to be different. So it's got to be different. Yeah, it's got to be different. We can't call them the same thing. So portal was interesting. I know on the show, my show yesterday, we talked about the transfer portal, right, with college sports and how I wish I could enter the portal now and go to Celebration Key. <laughs> but it's going to be interesting. They're going to hit all the points. It looks like uh, family fun and lagoons and pools and splash pads, uh, and then adults only. If you want that option, they're going to hit it. Uh, and then, you know, maybe some more upscale of private, you know, private adult stuff as well. And so can it compete with Perfect Day at Coco K, who I agree with you is just a crazy experience. It really is. I don't know. And it sounds like, too, they gave a hint, too, right, uh, that there's more to come. We plan on building a water park. We plan on doing this. But in the video, there were two water slides. So I was like, is that going to be open in 2025, the water slides, or is that the to come part? Or is there more? I don't know. One thing I think that's very interesting for for both of our audiences that Royal does right is uh, if you have if you purchase internet package uh, on board your Royal ship, you have internet at Perfect Day. If you purchase the beverage package on board, then you get your drinks there at Perfect Day. Will Carnival step out and do the same? Because they don't do that right now with Half, Half Moon Key. Yeah, I certainly I certainly hope so. That is such an advantage that Royal has and it makes like buying a drink package a better value proposition because you know you're going to have a day at Coco K and you're trying to calculate, well, you know, if I'm not getting to use that drink package at Coco K, then, you know, is this drink package really worth it? And I know that Carnival Cruise Line sells a ton of drink packages. It's probably you know, a big profit center for them. But man, I think it would be such a solid thing to do for the loyal Carnival Cruiser for the loyal consumer of cruising to go ahead and extend that out so that you could use your drink package and to your point wi-fi wi-fi is so expensive right now if you know the nice thing about at least uh, coco k and you know uh you know the msc's private island ocean key that you know, most of them have yeah. cell towers there and we're, we're in a great place i think at least with technology and communications where most cell phone plans work internationally without too much effort so at least when we're at these private islands, we have some access to you know Wi-Fi through a cellular tower. But it would be so much better if it was through the cruise ship. The interesting thing, though, we see, you know, we talk about Castaway Key uh, for Disney. We talk about Harvest uh, K. We talk about, you know, Ocean K. We talk about this new celebration key. A lot of that is there in the Bahamas. And we've had this interesting situation play out over the last week where, the U.S. Embassy sent out a little bit of an alert saying, hey, it's a little sketchy in Nassau, a little sketchy in the Bahamas right now. we got some some crime going on. And then we've had the State Department, you know, add an addendum to their level two warning saying, hey, watch out what you do from an excursion perspective. Um, do you think these private islands are helping places like the Bahamas? Are they hurting places like the Bahamas? I mean, uh, you know, the Bahamas are backpedaling right now. The prime minister out again today saying, hey, it's safe here. Please come down here. But, you know, beyond just coming down there, now the cruise lines themselves are taking you away from, you know, going into the local communities. Do you think this is good or bad for the places we visit, good or bad for cruising? What's your take on that? Yeah, really interesting uh, material there. Uh, I think I think there's a game going back and forth. Uh, you covered uh, the Bahamas and their expansion and investment in Nassau. I mean, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to accommodate 30 you know 25 or 30,000 cruise passengers a day um and then the notion that these cruise lines are are investing their own private money in their private islands is taking away passengers from places like Nassau and Freeport and so does it make sense that that you see maybe an increase of crime or an increase at least of of risk of crime uh to those who want to commit crime if you've got uh, a smaller audience a smaller group of people visiting 
Maybe you take more risk. Maybe maybe uh, crime is maybe a little bit more open in the public than what it was before. And so it's an interesting time right now because, as you said, the U.S. government says be careful, uh, right? Be careful tra traveling to these places. Uh, but then the locals in the Bahamas are saying, no, everything's great. We're safe here. And so I think it's important. Uh, I know that, that you know those who follow you and, and Jenny works with so many people, you know, that you share those tips of planning ahead and making sure that you do excursions that you trust. You're not you're not going to show up and just uh, buy something there on the pier. Go through the cruise line. Go through something reputable if you don't go through the cruise line. Uh, and then, of course, be aware of your surroundings. Have your phone and things like that. Uh, it's important now more than ever. Yeah, some of the more scary stories I think we covered last year are people that just rented, you know, if you, you've been, I'm sure you've been to Nassau, yeah. right? You just walk in the yeah. streets and there's just some yeah. guy on the corner going, hey, you want to rent this scooter? And there's people that rent it. And it's like, that's just some guy on the street, you know, yeah. that, you know, it, it seems crazy to me. I don't, I wouldn't do that at home, <laughs> but here I am in a foreign country and I'm like, yeah, hey guy on the street, yeah. what is it? 40 bucks? I'll rent the scooter. And we've had some horrible stories of people, you know, uh, for whatever reason, you know, having trouble because they've rented a motorcycle. We had that sad story earlier in the week and uh, last week. And then, of course, we, you know, there's stories people end up in the hospital with no way to get home because they did a $40 scooter rental on the side of the street. It, it's it's a wild thing. I think, uh, you know, the the thing that's interesting, I guess my observation is, uh, fortunately, the cruise lines make cruising out of the U.S. easy, right? You can do it with a passport and a photo ID. They take you to places that are really accommodating to American tourists like the Bahamas and, you know, other places, Cozumel, that kind of thing. But I think because of that, I think maybe uh, a lot of people take it for granted that you're actually cruising to a foreign country that has a different risk profile than just going, you know, you know, of course, there's plenty of dangerous cities in the United States. There's yeah. danger everywhere else. But, uh, you know, it, it's different, in my opinion. It's different when you go to a foreign country. Um, do you think the cruise lines do enough to or should they? Is it their responsibility to say, hey, man? You're going to a foreign country, you know, keep your head on a swivel, have your wits about you, have some situational awareness, or is it, you know, uh, we're, we're selling travel to responsible adults and it's on them to know the difference. How do you counsel, and you guys have a travel business, how do you counsel the people that you are booking travel for, for that kind of circumstance? Absolutely. It is, you talk about a tightrope and walking a tightrope. Cruise lines, I, you're right, they have a responsibility to share uh, risk that their passengers are taking whenever you sign up for this cruise. And of course, the, the passenger contract, which is 90 plus pages for most cruise lines, have a lot of those risks in there. But for cruise lines, it's walking a tightrope because how much do you, do you give that warning, even though it needs to be shared? How much do you give it before you start to scare people or, or say, okay, well, we're not going to cruise to these, pla these places. We're not going to take the seven day cruises. We're going to go on a short trip, you know, or, we're going to go with another cruise line who visits their uh, their private island and comes back, you know, like Royals looking to do with the Utopia. You know, some of those cruises are going to perfect day and back. Yeah, you know, it's not a very big risk. Um, and so it is walking a tightrope with cruise lines. I think they need to do more, honestly, whether and especially they do they do a decent job right before the cruise. Right. You might get an email of, hey, here's a heads up on things to look out for. But they don't do a very good job necessarily before that. But I will say, uh, you know, our clients, you know, a lot of times, especially in Nassau, uh, our clients like to go other places than Atlantis. Atlantis is great, but you're going to pay for Atlantis. And so they say, what can we do besides that? Or we've done that. We don't want to pay $160 a person. Uh, and, and we went to Jimmy Buffett's new uh, Margaritaville Resort. Uh, it's been probably 18 months ago. It was brand new when we went. And I remember we walked there. It's about a five-minute walk. We walked there. We enjoyed the day. We took a taxi back. It's $5 a person to take a taxi back. And I was thinking just the other day with this recent news, you know, should I be suggesting that people walk, walk there because it's close? And a lot of people will choose to walk there because they'll save the, you know, $20 bill for a family of four plus a tip. So that, yeah, okay, I'll walk there. But do you want to take on some risk walking down, yes, a public road, a crowded road, or do you hop in the taxi? And then that's a whole other argument. Is the taxi safe? You know, which one are you more likely to uh, to have more risk in? Sometimes it's a toss-up. It is. But traveling in a group, 
uh, having your communication, having your head on a swivel, uh, keeping your possessions as close to you as you can, in front of you if you can, and limit uh, what all you bring. You know, there's some people, and of course you see it, bring two huge beach bags. You know, it's all this stuff. Yeah. Bring only what you need to. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's an interesting thing because, you know, I, I love to travel as much as anybody else. And, you know, because we go out there, we make content. Sometimes we're carrying around some expensive camera gear and stuff like that. And I've been trying to be more aware, trying to take smaller gear, trying to, you know, be more inconspicuous than I have in the past. I was going to ask you have, you, have you ever had a circumstance where you felt uncomfortable i have one i'll share after that but have you ever been anywhere where you're like i don't i don't quite feel good in this circumstance uh there have been a couple of places uh honestly and and uh probably it was myself who who, who uh i put myself there you know uh one of them i can remember a time in in montego bay uh jamaica you know and jamaica has two different stigmatisms if you if you uh ask people who have never been People think Jamaica's great and it's beautiful and it's pretty, and there are parts absolutely that are. And then uh, some people think, you know, Jamaica, I'm not even going to get off the ship. There's a lot to do in Jamaica, but uh, it, that is just an example of a place where you really need to be on top of things. Mm. Uh, and you don't need to walk. You know, I, I told Amanda we're going to walk a half a mile to this beach. We should not have walked a half a mile to the beach, okay? Right outside the port area, you know, it's uh, – you can be – I'm – you can sell me whatever you want to sell me. You can offer a souvenir. You can offer me a bracelet, whatever you want to offer me. That is fine. But when I say no, the answer is no. That's the end of the sale. Go on to someone else. And and sometimes, especially when people are desperate, right, uh, they're not going to take no for an answer. They're going to offer you something else. I'll give you two of these, you know, for <laughs> $7 or whatever it is. And so I, before I knew it, was in a situation where, especially it was really because Amanda was with me, where I was upset with myself. You know, we had walked too far uh, we don't need to do that. And so that's that's really when when you're walking around some of these places, and Jamaica is just an example, and this could happen anywhere, as you said, even at home. Uh, but when you when you have your head on a swivel and you're looking around watching, you can feel the moment when you think, okay, I probably don't need to go any further. And don't be afraid to turn around and, and go back, and I should have them. Yeah, well, when you were talking earlier, it reminded me of a circumstance. I was in Cozumel, Mexico, and I didn't really communicate. Uh, Jenny B was with me. She stayed on the ship. I didn't communicate well with her what my plan was. And we'd gotten off at the Carnival Pier, and I wanted to go to where the Royal cruise ships, where the not, not even uh, the Norwegian cruise ships dock, which is more downtown, the big mega supermarkets there. And so I decided to take a taxi. So I walked through the, you know, the port area. I went to the cab stand, and I talked to a person saying, "Hey, I want to go to the mega supermarket. How much does that cost?" They gave me a price. And I thought I'd be getting in the cab with the very nice, pleasant person that was soliciting me, talking to me at the cab stand. Yeah. It wasn't. They put me into a car with a complete stranger, and I'm carrying a big camera rig. And I get in the car, and uh, you know, I said hello to the guy, and the guy said hello, and I said, you know, the nice day that we're having, and he's like, yeah, we're not having that nice of a day, and I don't think we're gonna have a nice day. That's what he said to me. And then off we went. And so we got off the main road, which I'd been to this mega before, and it's you just take a left out of there yeah. and you just stay on that street. And yeah. we were in some side neighborhoods and, you know, just the demeanor of the guy and just, you know, we were off the beaten path from what I knew. I was like, wow, did, you know, did I make a mistake, you know, jumping in this cab? Did I make a mistake not telling somebody that I was going here? It all worked out fine. I mean, I think that's the, that's the big takeaway. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that people be overly – afraid when they go to the Bahamas or to the Jamaica or to, you know, to Cozumel or to any of these places, any of the places in Europe that I've gone to any, I'm not suggesting that, you know, we'd be fearful. I mean, that's the, you know, we travel for the adventure, but I think being mindful is really the key there and just uh, have some good policies in place, buddy system, letting somebody know where you're going and then just being situationally aware. But I mean, that's to me, that's the adventure and the beauty of travel. But just like every other time in life when we travel around the country, there is some some challenges that you can run into. And so I, I think that's a really great conversation. I do think it's a thought process that most people that travel should have. And so I definitely encourage that. Let's talk more specifically about what your cruising profile is. When you go on a cruise, and imagine you're just going for, for leisure, you're just going with your family or whatever. What do you like most about cruising? What are the things that, what's a normal day look like for you on a cruise ship? What do you like to do? 
Absolutely. And how much that has changed over time. You know, uh, I got whenever we went on that honeymoon cruise, one thing that I really enjoyed, uh, Amanda being a school teacher, I coached for a long time and, and that was a previous life almost. Uh, but we enjoyed getting away, right? You put your cell phone up, you put your computer up, you get away from everything. Uh, and I joined that for a lot of cruises, but, uh, things change, like I said. And so now, uh, with Island time and you know, this with what you do, uh, it's neat. It's neat. Now it's, it's hard to disconnect, but it's neat to meet people of, you know, people that you, that watch your content every day and people that, uh, you know, that comment on your videos and you know, their usernames, um, and they walk up. It's always interesting because they walk up and they know who you are. They know what you look like. They know what your name is and you don't know what their name is because <laughs> a lot of times we interact behind our profiles and maybe we have a profile picture or something, but that's always fun. And so it's changed in that regard, but there's still some things that I love to do uh, and enjoy cruising. And so part of that is I still put my phone up for the most part. I create content. I try not to post a lot whenever, uh, whenever I'm on board. Uh, and I've kind of found going live. I'll go live. You can see it as it is, but I'm not going to record and edit while I'm on the ship. And that mm. limits some of my work time. You know, I'm just going to show it as it is, and people still get that feel, and they know I'm on the ship. Uh, but then uh, just able to to adventure and be adventurous with Amanda. And one thing that's really special to me uh, is, is my two boys. Uh, my oldest is eight years old today. My youngest will be five. Uh, and being able to bring them along with us. And we don't do it always. Uh, every, you know, Once every five or six trips, Amanda and I will go on our own. We need that. Everybody needs that. But bringing our boys and, and able to uh, being able to provide that experience that I most certainly didn't ever have. But, uh, you know, they're they're at an age it's fun to see them we visit a new place and they ask questions about the culture and the food and the languages and uh all that is real interesting to me and so uh able to uh, just show them uh the world show them traveling show them the different cultures and things like that is so neat to me and i find a lot of joy in uh setting something up showing up and then watching amanda and the boys smile or relax that that is cruising to me yeah, that, that's awesome. What, what's a sea day look like for you and the family? Yeah, absolutely. So we a lot of times uh, you've got to hit a good breakfast. I'm big on that. It, a good big breakfast, a light lunch is what I prefer, and then let's go outside. Uh, I like the water, uh, and sometimes it's iffy, right? You step outside, you see the pool, you see the hot tub. If you're early enough in the day, okay, I'll get I'll get in the pool, or the hot tub. Uh, if I'm gonna, if I get there midday, you know, it may be I may not be getting in the pool, or the hot tub. <laughs> but we'll go to the water park. The kids like the water park. I ride the slides <laughs> with with the kids. I yell, scream down the slide, uh, and and it's been really neat to see what cruise lines have done, especially the last decade now, on creating different experiences. Uh, whether you want to lay out by the pool. Um, but still see activities and still hear live, you know, music and still drums. You can do that. There's quiet places you can go, read a book, take a nap if you want to. And then uh, there's the things like the ropes course uh, and water parks and splash pads. And so for the majority of a sea day, we are outside. We are enjoying the sun. We are lathering up in sunscreen. The Irish blood in us uh, <laughs> doesn't like the sun, but we put on that uh, Neutrogena. A beach defense is what we use. And uh, and then usually about mid-afternoon, kids are ready for a nap. Amanda's ready for the nap. Uh, so uh, we get inside. We all shower. Uh, and they take their naps. And then usually I hit up the casino before dinner. That's uh, I like to roll the dice a little bit. Oh, nice. The test of fate. So it, it craps is your game of choice? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nice. absolutely. And there's been a change in that, too. It's been neat to see uh, it, some people like it and some people hate it. And, again, you were on the Jubilee last week. You know, they've raised some of those minimums uh, in the casino, and we hear a lot about that from some of our clients. Uh, but used to it was $5, and I appreciated that because uh, it was very inclusive of all people that could play. Some people, they have a $100 bill for the week to cruise with. And with the minimums at $5, maybe they could play a little bit. Uh, but I know that they've raised those some. I know when we cruised, the craps minimum was $15. Uh, and yeah. that makes it a little bit more difficult, you know, unless you're winning money, then it's like, okay. Um, but it's it's been neat to see the changes in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. The $15 minimum on the craps table 
all times of the day on the Jubilee. Uh, it, it was pleasant. I was uh, earlier this year. I was on the MSC Seashore just for about forty hours. Uh, they finally have a craps table on some MSC cruise ships. That didn't used to be true, but it was nice. They had a five dollar minimum. So, yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Even like if you travel to Las Vegas or if you travel, they just got craps uh, down here in Tampa. This is a new thing for Florida. The next level of gambling. The casinos here now have craps tables, but they don't. You know, the minimum there is like ten dollars. So, yeah, it's getting yeah. expensive to gamble. Of course. Casino is a huge uh, profit center for the cruise ships. Uh, at night, you go. Are you? Where do you eat at at night with the with the kids? You guys uh, hit the main dining room. You do the buffet. Mix it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the Jubilee in particular, I really enjoyed it because of some of the the free options. You know, some of the options that cost on other ships are free right now on Jubilee. But we a lot of times we go to the main dining room. We do enjoy have, sharing a dinner around the table. Uh, and I'll, I will say uh, one thing Carnival Cruise Line does really well uh, and that the staff are trained in is how to be accommodating of families, especially families with young kids. The young kids aren't going to sit there quietly for an hour and a half. <laughs> You know, they're just not going to do it. And so no matter how well behaved they are, they usually are, uh, they're not going to. And so, you know, Carnival, they know this, and Royal does a good job of this, too. You know, right when you sit down, they're taking the kids' orders first. Mm. Uh, you know, do they want chicken nuggets and fries? Do they want a pizza? Whatever it is. And they're bringing that food a lot of times before we get our our appetizers, you know, or maybe at the same time. And it takes kids longer to eat. And so really that keeps them busy if they're hungry. That keeps them busy just about the full course of the meal. And so we enjoy main dining room. Uh, we are going to try. We're going to go to the Steakhouse uh, Fahrenheit 555 next month. We did not do that on the inaugural. Uh, of course, you got to pay for that. And I thought, you know what? Um, it wasn't the money part necessarily for me. I didn't want to pay for it. The kids not be good. And then we leave uh, because they're distracting others who paid for their meal, you know? Yeah. It's, it's to tough. <laughs> it's tough. I, you know, so I'm at the point in my life, my kids are, and happy birthday to your son. I mean to say that. Uh, you. Yeah. My kids this year will be 23. I have six. They'll be 23 years old to wow. 33 years old. And so when we started cruising, they weren't little kids anymore. So I'm really fascinated when I get to talk to someone who is cruising with uh, younger children. I know you've cruised a lot on Carnival Cruise Line, yeah. but I know because of your business, you've also researched a lot of other cruise lines and you've cruised other cruise lines. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what do you feel like some of the best cruise lines to cruise on with children are and, and maybe why? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll say this, and, and and Tony, you probably know this, you've cruised extensively through a lot of cruise lines. And I share this with my clients, you know, 90 plus percent of what goes on and the, what the atmosphere that, that is trying to be created uh, among different cruise brands is the same. There's a lot that is similar, but there's a few things that's different. And I think, uh, you know, accommodating kids and families is one thing that is different across cruise lines. And so, uh, the two really that stick out to me are is Royal Caribbean International and Carnival Cruise Line. Uh, they do a, an awesome job, a phenomenal job, even starting before your cruise takes place. Of you can re, you can pre-register your kids with both cruise lines to get them ready and and to get them enrolled uh, in their camp ocean and their their adventures uh, there. And then to have a service of uh, or the the option for these cruise lines uh, to help watch your kids, you know, and there are some people we see them on social media, right? If you don't watch your own kids, you don't need to bring them to the kids club. You know, you brought them, you need to keep them. <laughs> but that's not always the case for us. We, ours are with us during the day, all day. Um, we have dinner together. The kids club at Carnival and Royal both open up at seven o'clock. Uh, and so we take our kids after dinner uh, at seven o'clock, and then we enjoy two or three hours. Uh, you know, we go go grab a couple of drinks, go to a comedy show, or whatever it is. Um, but uh, the option to have this service for cruise lines to watch your kids, to babysit your kids, to have activities for your kids for free during the day is awesome. And Royal and Carnival both, one thing they do really well uh, is if you're uneasy about leaving your kiddos, if you're unsure, they will give you a phone. They will give you a cell phone. <laughs> Here, here is the phone. They'll give it to you for the entire cruise. You don't turn it back in every time you go. Here's your phone. Go enjoy your evening. If your child is upset, if we can't console your child or something like that, we will call you. 
Uh, and so that adds some comfort as well to some parents who's like, well, well you know, I don't want to leave my kids. Uh, they may, they may, you know, leave them for a couple hours and go enjoy themselves. And so, uh, and then I wanted to mention too, that a lot of families don't realize this or get involved with it, but there's so much that, uh, Carnival and Royal do in particular that involves the whole family. Uh, they're not just kid clubs where you drop off your kids. I'll see you in a little bit and go, but there are scavenger hunts. There are parties at night and they keep them short, 30 or 45 minutes. But the whole family's invited to come to this party to create a craft, something to take home uh, that you could put somewhere, you know, in your in your home and remember your cruise by. And we've gone to those activities before, and they're like not well attended at all. I mean, there might be a handful of families every time, whether it's middle of the day or at night. Uh, and so I encourage families, you know, check out check out the clubs. Don't be afraid to leave your kiddos a little while. Take the phone. They will call you. But then also get involved with the different story time and, and craft events and scavenger hunts. Uh, we've had a lot of fun looking for, you know, 20 items on the cruise ship. The first one to find them, take a picture and come back wins. That's a lot of fun. So I'd encourage people to do that. Okay, so I'm going to delve a little bit into the controversial. I remember yeah. a story from a few years ago where there was a mom who was off the cruise ship and uh, and her kids were on the cruise ship. Yes. And there was some there was some concern whether or not she was going to make it back to the cruise ship and the kids were on the cruise ship. What what do you think about this? Do you think that that if you have small children, do you think it's okay to leave them on the cruise ship during a port day in the care of the cruise line while you go out to port. This has always blown my mind. Both parts of it. One, for cruise lines to take on some risk, responsibility, most definitely, of we will watch your kids. You're going to be out of pocket. You know, this is like you're going out of town. We will watch your kids. You go what you do what you want to do it. Go to the beach resort, go shopping, whatever you want to do. You know what time you have to be back on. Pick up your kid when you get back on. That service has always blown me away. And I've always thought there's no way I could do that. I don't I don't care how much I needed a break, I couldn't do that. The second part is is exactly what I said. I, I, parents and they do. They take cruise lines up on this offer of okay, yeah, let's leave Johnny here. <laughs> and I'm going to go enjoy myself and I will see you later. I still can't believe that cruise lines offer that. It's there is liability. Like you said, and that's, I remember that story uh, years ago, but then just everyday liability as well, you know, with the child staying there, it's uh, I couldn't do it most definitely, but I'm surprised cruise lines still offer something like that. I, I couldn't do it either. Th this conversation about kids though is a important conversation, especially to people that help others plan their vacations, which you and Amanda do. Uh, if somebody's coming to you, new cruiser, they don't really have any idea of cruise lines or cruise ships or destinations, yeah. how do you work them through that process of planning their first cruise vacation? What, what are some of the things that you talk to them about? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think, you know, a lot of times just trying to see what do you expect uh, from this trip? What are you expecting from the vacation? Uh, is it great ports of call? Are you wanting to see the most beautiful beaches in the world? Is it more of I want to be still, I want to relax, things like that. So trying to trying to gauge what they want first off and then trying to pair it with whatever cruise line I think is going to deliver that experience or whatever itinerary, itinerary is going to, uh, you know, provide that experience. Uh, and then find, you know, find a comfortable place where they want to stay budget friendly, whatever it is, uh, to make sure they find where they want to stay. But then I think where, where I think, um, you know, PVPs in particular and, and some travel advisors kind of get a bad rap sometimes is, you know, you get someone booked and then you never hear from them again. Uh, mm. and I think that there are different, you know, uh, levels of service there. I know uh, Jenny B and she's on top of it all the time of being available to, you know, when someone says, we want to snorkel and you as the travel advisor, you know, their itinerary uh, for you to be able to suggest, you know, Hey, I've been to all these places a dozen plus times. I suggest you snorkel in Belize. They've got great snorkeling. Let me help you find an excursion. I think, you know, that provides a difference there uh, that, that a lot of places, you know, they don't get when you book on your own or a P or a 1-800 number of uh, PVP, but uh, so just, really leading them through with them being a new cruiser. And then one thing I mentioned this earlier and I never shared what it was, but encouraging after you plan this awesome trip, 
and and your client goes and they have a fantastic time. They come back and they say, we want to go again. Uh, I think uh, letting them know, I know you had a great time uh, and we could book another trip. You're going to have a great time again but encouraging them to try a different experience. They enjoyed that adventure, they enjoyed that experience. You know, before you take your third, fourth, fifth, 10th cruise with the same cruise line, let's let you try this one. It is almost the same, 90% plus the same, but try this experience, you may like it more. Or if you don't, you're still gonna like it, but you will know next time, okay, I wanna, I wanna go back to this one. Uh, and so I think just, just providing that thought leadership there of, of trying to help them manage what they want, pair it with that, and then provide future experiences is one thing that I think we do a good job at. Ah, that's excellent. Uh, here, here's the thing. Uh, right here at the beginning of 2024, the demand for cruising, as high as it's ever been, we're, we're certainly back from the shutdown that we had. But we see the price of cruising going up, up, and up because of that demand, the cruise lines, uh, as they should, as businesses taking advantage of that demand curve, and they're able to raise their prices when people are coming to you to book a cruise, what's what's the most important thing to them right now? Is it is it price? Is it ship? Is it destination? It really is price. It is, and uh, I know you guys see this too. You know, we get we get emails and calls every day. Hey, I want a good deal. I can leave April from Florida. I want a good deal. And you know, used to good deal 2021, 2022 meant a cheap price. You know, you could get on board for cheap. You could cruise four or six times a year. Now it's like, okay, what's your definition of a good deal? Because if you're wanting a cruise out of Florida in April, you want seven days. Uh, you're not going to pay, you know, less than $1,000 total like you were going to pay before. You're going to – a good deal may be uh, the stateroom category that you want is open. <laughs> that may be the good deal these days. Oh, you want a balcony? There's still uh, balconies available in April. Yeah, I mean that—that that is the good deal yeah. these days. You know, you mentioned the demand. I heard uh, Carnival Cruise Line. I, I was on a call. It's been a couple of weeks ago, but they said when the the calendar turned from December 31st, 2023, to January 1st, 2024, 72 percent of inventory was sold. Mm. 72%. And so there's not a ton of inventory. And so really, I think the good deal is, uh, hey, I can travel this week, this month, and I would love to stay in a balcony cabin. Let's yeah, see if we can get you a book. That's the I, good I, deal. I believe it because uh, I just had the Sun Princess inaugural cancel, which uh, left uh, the first two and a half, three weeks of February open for me. And uh, to your point, in the past, if I had three weeks ahead of me, I could look uh, a week ahead, I could look two weeks ahead, and I would usually have a lot of good choices for cruises. I live in Florida, I'm fairly close to five different cruise ports, I can fly to other cruise ports. I spent a whole day, I, I think it was Monday, just looking at cruises, and every cruise that I thought, okay, a week from now that I would like to jump on, 10 days from now that I would like to jump on, no, no, no room, uh, no cabins. And uh, so it, yeah, it, it was kind of mind blowing to me. Maybe, you know, now I'm on a little forced hiatus, which is probably good. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's crazy times. It, 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 but it brings an interesting conversation around. I want to talk a little bit about the total cost of cruising. We see yeah. cruise lines, particularly like a carnival, they'll advertise the base rate to get you into a cabin. But that base rate often doesn't include things like, the gratuities. It doesn't often include things like a drink package. It doesn't include things like specialty dining. And a lot of times people make that decision just on the base price. But then there's a big, um, you know, a big uh, upheaval a little bit in cruising sometimes about nickel and diming. What, what do you consider? Uh, and I, I struggle to define what that means. What, what do you consider nickel and diming to be? <laughs> this is a good debate here. What what price should be shown? What should be included in that price? And you're right. The the name of the game, especially with prices as high as they've been in a long time, higher than even 2019, they want to put the lowest price they can, so you're intrigued by it. Uh, but when it doesn't include things like gratuities, which they say, of course, are optional, they're not really optional. You need to pay your gratuities. If you're going to cruise, pay your gratuities. They need to be added on there. Trip insurance is a huge thing as well. There's so many people that waive it. Uh, and you never know what's going to happen in today's world uh, with jobs. And you know, a lot of times they say, 
uh, I'm going to go on this cruise. I know I'm going to go on this cruise. But they don't think about small things like the economy or, or uh, layoffs, changes in the marketplace, uh, things like that. Um, but and then, like you said, nickel and diming, you get on, you pay your cruise rate, you get on board. What all is included? It seems like a lot of times today it's it's less than ever. You know, it's uh, you get your tea, lemonade and water with most cruise lines. Uh, but then, you know, I've noticed uh, with Carnival, uh, for example, they have several uh, specialty dining venues, and I'll call them specialty dining, and some of them are specialty dining, but some of them, uh, it's like it's like sushi. Uh, hey, it's $8 for a roll, which is not a bad price, right? Uh, but maybe you could, have you could have found that years ago, uh, one or two days a week on the cruise. And I noticed uh, the Icon of the Seas. One thing I noticed with the Icon is there were several places on board uh, that had... 80% uh, of their menu was, was uh, it charged you extra, maybe $8 mm. for a hamburger, $6 for, uh, you know, a pretzel or whatever it is. But then it would have like two or three things that were free, you know. So if you want the hot dog, that's free. You know, if you want something else, it's free. And so it's neat. It's, it's been neat to see this shift. Uh, but at the same time, it is a nickel and dime experience. You walk up and you want the hamburger, uh, but you've got to get the hot dog because the hot dog is free. And so uh, their added cost at the end of the day, you know, to those that cruise, uh, yourself, myself, and everyone included, and you've really got to plan ahead really is, is what I try to do myself and try to share with others to know what's included, know where you can eat for free. And then mentally, you don't have to make a list per se, but know that, okay, I can go to Guy's Burger one day. I can have that. The hamburger is going to be great. I can go to, you know, Shaq's Big Chicken. I can go to the Windjammer. It's free and it's, you know, great food. So know where you can go and, and know all those options, all those places. So you're not hitting the same place every time. And then by day three, you're like, well, I've ate at the buffet for three days. <laughs> now I'm going to go pay for this, you know, because yeah. I'm tired of it. When there's maybe eight other places you could eat for free. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the that's the biggest thing that I that tell the people that are going cruising for the first time is know all the places that you can go and then also know what's going on on the cruise ship. I, I don't think you should yeah. – I'm not a big fan of over-planning the cruise, but I'm also not a fan of not, not knowing what's going on. Like I like <laughs> to take that daily paper and highlight a few things yeah. and say I'll go to one of them, that kind of thing. Uh, so here's an interesting conversation. We see cruise lines like Prince's starting to offer – you know, it's still an additional fee, but they're offering like their Premier Plus where yeah. you can, you know, get your you know, Wi-Fi included. You can get your drinks included. You can get your gratuities added. And I feel like that's one way where you're, you know, to go ahead and pay so you don't get nickel and dimed on those things. But then people are like, well, I don't drink, so I don't want the drink package, or I prefer to handle my gratuities my own way, or I don't want the Wi-Fi. So I still struggle in the space to understand do you think people want an all-inclusive cruise experience, or do you think they want an a la carte cruise experience, which to me isn't a la carte just nickel and diming? I, I don't know. It, it is. It really is. And uh, a lot of people enjoyed, like Princess and, Nor and Norwegian, who have bundled some of these you know, most popular add-ons, nickel and dime I items, uh, they've bundled those up, given you a discount if you buy all of them. But now we're starting to see, I think it was Princess earlier this week who said, you know, if you don't buy our our package, but you want internet, we're raising our internet now to $24.99 per day. And you're like, when you do the math on that, you know, and then you look at the package, you're like, well, I, I want the internet and maybe I want my gratuities included. So just those two things alone are going to lead me to the package. You know, and so it's been interesting to see what they've done. But I would I would like to see some of the bigger players in the game, the bigger fish in the sea, come up, step out on a limb and say, you know, here's our packaged price. And they've got to make money on it. Right. A, a lot of times cruisers I think cruisers want Royal Caribbean and Carnival in particular, uh, the two, you know, two big brands to come out with something because they think it's going to save them money. And maybe it will. But the only way Royal and Carnival are going to come out and have any type of package is if they're making money on the package. You right. know, if they're yes. going to create this package and then, okay, well, we're going to actually, we're going to lose money uh, than what we usually have with the nickel and dime version. And so it's, it's tough, but I hope maybe, hopefully one day, that there will be packages from some of the bigger brands. You mentioned, you know, the cruise companies, they're going to make money, and it's wild. We look at these quarterly report outs, and they're making billions of dollars. And, of course, the <laughs> counter argument is they were billions of dollars in debt. 
but it, it, it's a weird dance. So, you know, cruising's more popular than ever. We have more new people coming into it. And the wild thing is, so I've been cruising for seven years. You've been cruising for 12 years. When I first started cruising, room service was free. It wasn't a la carte. It wasn't an additional fee. They came and they you know, uh, worked on your room twice a day. You had a daily cleaning and then a turn down service. Uh, you know, you had the pizza 24 hours, for example, on Carnival Cruise yeah, Line. Had, had All of those things have changed. But <laughs> whoever starts cruising for the very first time tomorrow, they don't they don't know that. And so it's a it's a weird I think it's a weird dance because people that are seasoned cruisers, loyal cruisers, the, you recognize the change. But I think that the cruise lines know that, well, you know, we might lose a few, but we're probably not going to lose that many. And then the new people are this is just going to be the status quo. It's just a, a challenge for me as somebody who watches the industry to see profitability skyrocket. Yeah. on the back of services going down and uh again it's a business you know the, the you know the consumers that you know they dictate what what happens because as long as we bear these changes then you know the business is going to make the changes so it's a um, it's an interesting yeah. dance but it, it is a kind of funny thing when you think about everybody clamoring about nickel and diming but then if you offer them a f completely all inclusive service at a higher price they're like well I don't want that either so it's I don't know how you can have both honestly but it, it's yeah. an interesting thing let's let's talk I feel like and I feel like carnival has the best included food at sea uh, with all of the different and the, it, there's an interesting debate that lies there um you know I I remember early on when I was doing this, uh, somebody chided me because I was, I like guys burger, right? I thought, man, I, I could eat guys burger every day. I think I said that. And somebody came back and goes, of course you could eat guys burger. That way you don't go to the main dining room and eat a steak. They're, they're tricking you by getting you to eat cheap food instead of expensive food. Um, I, I don't know. Do, do you think the included food on Carnival? Do you think it cheapens the experience, or do you think it enhances the experience? Do you feel Do you feel satisfied by getting that many included options, or do you think they're you're getting hoodwinked? Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, with XL class ships, like we were talking about earlier, uh, just providing more options for people to eat, especially what they've done with some of these restaurants that on other ships and for the last several years or, or, or decade or more have have cost uh, and they're free. And so uh, bringing on you know Shaq's Big Chicken, a, a chicken option has been really good. We enjoyed that and there's breakfast there as well. And then uh, Chibang, you know, the Mexican and Chinese fusion together. Although they say it's fusion, but it's two different menus. So I guess, I guess the fusion is <laughs> what you order, you know, and, and combine with. But that being a free option, right now in Jubilee, you can eat there every night if you want to. On Celebration, uh, you can eat there one time still for free. Um, and then Cucina del Capitano, the Italian restaurant, which is usually $18 on other ships, it's free. Uh, you know, I think some of that is experimental by Carnival uh, to see you know how people utilize those restaurants. Some of that is capacity-driven, too. I yeah, can't fit everyone inside those specialty restaurants. Uh, but I think Carnival... The, and I'm not a foodie per se. I don't cruise for the food, uh, but I think the options that they have on their XL class ships is is pretty good. One thing I think they could get better at and maybe learn from a Norwegian and and Royal Caribbean are grab and go options. I think yeah. we're seeing a, a lot of families now, and we're just society, really. I guess uh, you know they don't. We don't want to wait in line 20 minutes anymore at the buffet or pizza or, or guys burger sometimes. You know, where can I go grab a wrap, a sandwich, uh, a cup of fruit, uh, and go back to what I was doing, go back to Serenity Deck, go back to the pool, whatever it is. And so Carnival doesn't do a great job at those grab-and-go options, whereas some of the other cruise lines have realized that, and they're starting to move kind of into that space. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've talked a lot about the XL class, and of course, you were recently on Carnival's new flagship cruise ship out of Galveston, Texas, the Carnival Jubilee. And uniquely, you also had an opportunity to go on Royal Caribbean's new cruise ship, the world's largest cruise ship, the Icon of the Seas. Uh, you know, as those being the premier ships on both of those lines, 
Uh, how do you compare and contrast those two? Uh, first, go ahead and, and talk a little bit about your experience on Icon. What do you think about that as a new class of cruise ship in the in the world of cruising? And then maybe uh, compare it a little bit about you know with what Carnival has going on with their latest yeah. cruise ship. Yeah, uh, what Royal Caribbean has done with the Icon is simply amazing. Uh, there's there's a lot of people who see the ship. Uh, it's got the title of the world's largest cruise ship, so some people already don't like it. Uh, and I, I've had a lot of people, a lot of, it's funny to see interactions of content, right? I post content and people will put one word, monstrosity. Uh, you know, really, is it a monstrosity to have that cruise ship? You know, if I gave you a free cruise on the ship, whoever wrote that, there are several that have, you would take <laughs> it, okay? Um, but it's amazing to see what they've done. It really is. The ship is huge. And they market it as that. Um, does she cross some boundaries? Uh, is there a theme park type of vibe or feel? Yeah, maybe. I know Jay from Ship Life. Um, he was on the inaugural Jubilee with us, and he was on the same three-day icon selling with us. So it was neat to get his perspective, too. Uh, and that's what kind of he thought was it's they've built this thing up as almost a theme park type of thing. Um, but it's I appreciate the engineering behind it and what, what's happened. Uh, there's a lot of people who say, I will not sell that class of ship because they are gearing only towards families. They are targeting families. They want kids on that ship, as many kids as they can get. Kids don't eat as much. They don't, you know, Royal Caribbean doesn't pay as much per passenger when you look at what it costs to cruise a kid versus an adult. And they want kids to be there. And I, Whenever I saw the marketing and I saw the advertising, I thought the same thing. I thought I would love to take my family on that ship. But it was not my family who went on the ship. It was Amanda and I who went on the Icon. And I was thoroughly surprised uh, that the neighborhoods really create places like Surfside, a new concept for Royal Caribbean. Uh, you know, the kids splash pad, the kids pool that's three feet deep, uh, the the different places to eat you know there's burgers and chicken nuggets and fries all of it free right there in surfside and it's neat because the families that were on our cruise really stayed for the majority of of the day in surfside so if you don't want kids on your trip um you may be at hideaway beach you may be somewhere on lido deck and there's not as many kids up there because they're all down there on deck eight at the surfside neighborhood or they're at Thrill Island riding the six water slides, uh, playing putt-putt, uh, climbing up the rock wall. Uh, so they're kind of families and kids are contained two different places, which means there's a lot of room for adults. Uh, there's a swim-up bar, of course, swim and tonic. Uh, I thought it was really neat. There's The menus float in the water, which was pretty cool. Oh, wow. And, you know, you can be... You can be standing in the water all of a sudden. Oh yeah, I'll take. I'll pick that that menu and uh, and order a drink. But there's not there's not any kids. You know, there wasn't in our cruise. You know, at swim and tonic. Uh, and so it's it's been neat to see trafficking wise. And I know Michael Bailey, you know, shared a lot about how they've designed the ship. They, you know, it's over six years to try to make sure that families get the experience that they want and that they pay for. But people too that don't have kids get a experience as well. So if you have written off the ship and, and said you're not going to go because you think it's marketed towards families, the, revisit that. Really revisit it. Uh, it was really, really neat. And uh, now, comparing it to Jubilee, a lot of people have had this question, how's it compared to Jubilee? Uh, my twin brother who's going in March, he asked me that. My sister, uh, you know, because they want to go on the bestest, you know, best, nicest ship that they can. Uh, and And so... It's different. It's all about value, too. Uh, you know, Royal Caribbean's icon for a seven-day cruise, uh, the cheapest week of the year, I think, is in September for two people in an interior guaranteed cabin is $6,000. Whew. You know, that's... Yowza. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know about that one, you know. Whereas you look at the Jubilee, uh, you know, and, a, and two people, you could get on, I don't know what the cheapest rate is, but you could get on safely for, you know, most weeks for $3,000. Mm -hmm. So when you look at value, you could take, you know, just about two, a two week cruise or a back to back or two cruises in a year on Carnival's newest product, the Jubilee or one on the icon, you know, now you tell me which one's better. I don't, you know, and you still don't know. And I know I'm hinting at Carnival there, but I'm not, you know, uh, 
whatever value you have, whatever value you put on your money, whatever you have that's expendable, uh, that help, could help you make your decision. Do I spend that and go on Icon of the Seas, go on the world's largest cruise ship and get everything that's involved with it? Or maybe do I t plan two weeks over here and go on what is still a great, a fantastic cruise ship, a great experience, uh, but maybe I can go uh, twice or maybe I get the suite on the Jubilee where I would have got an ocean view balcony on an Icon. Uh, you know, it's choices. It's not nice thing to have choices. It's so wild. Uh, I never thought that we would be talking about Royal in the same way that we used to talk about Disney Cruise Line. You know, people say, hey, uh, should I go on Disney Cruise Line? I'm like, you could go on Disney Cruise Line if you really love Disney. Uh, you could do one Disney Cruise or you could do two or three uh, Royal Caribbean Cruises or Norwegian Cruise Line Cruises or Carnival Cruise Lines. It seems like Royal yeah. is moving into that. And I certainly get the the fanfare around Icon right now. And, and kudos to Royal for changing the game yet again. One thing I really enjoyed yeah. about that and I enjoy about all of the Oasis class cruise ships is they put a lot of people on that cruise ship. But they do a good job of dispersing the people. And it sounds like what you've described with the kids yeah. is a, a nice dispersion. Uh, how full was your cruise, and uh, did it feel crowded? Where did it feel crowded? So that that is the tough part, and that's where it's it's not fair for me to speak fully regarding this. So the ship can hold upwards of 7,500 passengers, and then with crew, upwards of 10,000 people. Uh, on our sailing, our three-day sailing, there was 4,000 people total. Mm including crew. Uh, so, you know, Amanda would keep saying, oh, there's no line for this and we can go there. And, and uh, we didn't have reservations for the comedy show, but we showed up 10 minutes before and there was availability. Well, we got kind of a different experience of what's really going to take place. And that was one mm -hmm. thing that I was interested in uh, is, is to go back uh, and to see how does this work with 6,500, 7,000, 7,500 people on board? Is it the same experience as you mentioned? Are people spread out enough? Royal thinks they've found the secret sauce of making sure that happens. Um, but then again, you know, we'll see. I, I know that you know she's on her first paid passenger voyage now. And there's been nothing but great things. But we'll see as as uh, we get you know into the reality of of the cruise ship. Yeah, that one's going to be interesting. And I know you were on the Carnival Jubilee when it was fairly full. Did you find that cruise ship to be crowded? Do you think the XL class does a good job of spreading the yeah. crowd out? I think so. You know, that inaugural selling was pretty full. It may not have been at 100%. Uh, but I thought people moved well. You know, one thing that I that I enjoy, and it's, it's a personality thing, uh, you know, Carnival's uh, first come, first serve for shows, uh, it could be great. It may not be great. You know, if, if you show up early like you should to a comedy show, you're going to get a seat. If you show up uh, 15 minutes before, you're not going to get a seat. You know, in Royal Caribbean, you could have had a reservation and shown up 15 minutes before. So mm. it's a personality thing, I guess. But I, I enjoy, uh, you know, just the first come, first serve. And so a lot of places we went, uh, there, there was seating. And I'd say that that ship, I mean, it had to be close to 100%. It probably wasn't quite at 100 But uh, any show we wanted to see, uh, we got seats at. And then the lines weren't too long whenever you would visit, you know, the, the coffee shop or, uh, you know, a buffet or something like that. And so I thought people moved pretty well. And there's enough indoor and outdoor spaces with what they've done with Grand Central. You know, and there's always, there's trivia and there's bingo and there's, you know, and there's a it draws a crowd a large crowd that is there inside which of course helps the outside perimeters and areas not be as full as well so i i thought that they, they did a good job designing the jubilee and excel class mm. yeah uh, you know i had some lines i guess my biggest complaint about jubilee and crowds is to your point it is first come first serve i think that's fair play but the thing that became a challenge is that, hey, I want to go see a 45-minute show in center stage or I want to go see a 45-minute show in the main theater. Well, if I wanted to plan on doing that, I would have to commit an hour and 45 minutes to do that because I knew yeah. that if I didn't get to those venues as soon as they opened or an hour before, 
I wouldn't be able to get a seat for the show, which that, you know, I don't know what the solution to that is. I don't know if there is a solution to that, but it does change a little bit the dynamic of trying to do all the things in the nighttime. And, you know, maybe it's just a good way to slow you down anyways and, you know, try not to do everything. But it was uh, it was interesting. I really I really enjoyed the Jubilee. Let's uh, let's come back to something you were talking about in the beginning. You said you spent a lot of time cruising on Carnival, but now you kind of advise people to play the field a little bit to try a bunch of different cruise lines what do you think the secret sauce is for that how how much i know these cruise lines they all lay out their loyalty programs but i I think and maybe you'll agree with me i don't think the loyalty programs get good till later so what what do you recommend how 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 much cruising uh, yeah and we're we're in fortunate positions we get to cruise multiple times a year so say you're dealing with a one time a year cruiser how many years are they going to have to take before they their cruises will they have to take before they start thinking about being loyal? What what would you recommend? Yep, yep. Uh, great question. It is. Uh, you know, loyalty programs they they always impress me. And some cruise lines have better loyalty programs than other cruise lines. Royal I think does a great job, and Celebrity Princess does a great job. Uh, Carnivals is is maybe the worst on the market, honestly. But people who cruise Carnival, when you ask them why have you have why have you been on ten Carnival cruises and not another, they will point to the loyalty program. I get my bottle of water uh, and I get a drink on the last sea day after six. You know, <laughs> it's like that's what's keeping you here. You know, that, that's all it takes to keep you here. Um, I spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a free four dollar <laughs> bottle of water. <laughs> it's like, come on, come on. Um, but you know, someone that cruises once a year, maybe maybe you know every few years that can cruise twice a year. Uh, I would encourage you know those passengers, those cruisers, even more to really try different cruise lines. Try uh, try the big players in the game, but also there's niche players too. Norwegian does a really good job. MSC, who I mean they they have come out and said we are we're going to be the largest you know cruise line in the United States. Give us time. We're moving our headquarters to Miami. You know they're bringing the Seascape to Galveston. There's a lot of people excited about that. Um, but we're going to be here. Try those cruise lines uh, and then settle in to what you like. And before you know it, you will climb that loyalty ladder. But for cr- for cruisers that have cruised, you know, seven or less cruises, if the only thing that ties you to a particular cruise line is their loyalty program or your desire to climb that loyalty program, I would I will I will put together all loyalty programs from all cruise lines and send them to you. And you'll see. They're pretty similar on the lower end of the scale. Just go try something else. That way you know what you like. And you know when you spend your $2,500 or whatever for your cruise fare, you know that you've tried three other options. This is what I like. Uh, And it takes out some of the, well, I'm going to do this. But actually, at Virgin Voyages, I've heard good things about it. You know, It takes that out of your mind. I I think it's a great endorsement for using a travel advisor, travel agent, because I know, and you guys probably do the same thing, Jenny B, when somebody says, hey, I want to go to this place for this price, for this experience, she's really good about saying, you can do that three different ways. You can do it across three different cruise lines. She's always mindful, obviously, of, of who yeah. people are loyal to, that kind of thing. But I think that's really a great endorsement. And I know, you know, um, not, no pressure, but like, you know, people like to book their own thing. But, you know, yeah. you guys have probably booked a thousand cruises or more at this point. I, I know Jenny's well, booked exactly. more we're, than the. We're, we're about to hit that milestone. You hit yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jenny's booked thousands of cruises and uh, your travel advisors are free. So it, it would be, wow. you know, it, it's like talking to an expert for, for no, you know, no obligation and that kind of thing. So uh, very interesting stuff. So Derek, uh, man, such a great pleasure to talk to you. We talked about a lot of stuff and I know we yep. can talk about a lot more, but uh, man, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story and sharing your insights. I, I sure appreciate it, man. Hey, thank you. You are, you're one of the, the pillars uh, in in cruise news and experiences, uh, you've been around a long time. I will never forget the the first time I met you. Uh, the Mardi Gras was coming in uh, to Port Canaveral for the first time. I think I was about two weeks old, and I, it was at that point of stardom in an elevator. I was like Amanda. 
you know, hitting her, Amanda, Amanda, there's Tony, there's Tony <laughs> thinking you had no clue who I was. I, I can't even talk because this, you know, this guy, um, I was starstruck and, uh, the, the dedication and loyalty, uh, that, that you have to, to sharing what's right, sharing what's, what's transparent, what is honest is, com- is commendable. It is. And at the same time, the entertainment value that you provide, uh, is unmatched. And so, uh, I know a lot of people tell you that John Hild, you know, he nodded his hat to you today. <laughs> you know, he didn't. Uh, he said, "Hey, you know, this is this is the guy, and you are, and so I appreciate the opportunity, uh, you know, to to spend this time with you. And again, earlier in the year, I was in Tampa, and you you sacrificed a couple hours of your time to say, hey, yeah, we'll have dinner together, and that is much appreciated. I really do appreciate that. Well, man, uh, th- those kind of words are, are are nice to hear, and I appreciate it so much. And uh, yeah, we'll have to do this again. Yeah." Absolutely. Well, there you go. Such a great opportunity to talk to Derek from Island Time. We covered a lot. Uh, I just invite you to do two things. Uh, Number one, go check out Derek's content. Again, it's Island Time. I'll leave a link in the description below. And also make sure you're subscribed here to the La Lita Loca Cruise Podcast channel. That way you'll get all of the latest episodes in video format. And look, if you listen to podcasts uh, in your ears without the visual, we're on all the major podcasting platforms. Make sure that you are following us over there. A big thank you for checking out today's episode. This is Tony for La Lido Loca. And until the next time, we'll see you on the Lido. Bye.